Welcome, everybody, to Jorge's Isolation Podcast. I hope everybody's year is starting out amazingly. Today, I am joined by a very special guest, my friend Shannon Spangler. We met at Equinox way back when, what, 2014, 2015? It was right after I graduated college and you just graduated too. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like we were both like fresh out and like, great, we're gonna just gonna do this for a little while and then be yeah. actors and then like that'll be it and we're good to go. And yeah, give like, oh, us three weeks oh. and we're gone. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a, it's a different beast. But, um, you know, it, I'm really glad that, uh, you know, I have to say this first and foremost, I admire the work ethic you have. And we're going to get into that in just a little bit. And this is why I really wanted to talk to you because a lot of the people that I have on my podcast, a lot of people may not know the names of these people yet. And I always say yet, because I do see futures for every single one of my guests that I've had on so far. Um, for example, Robbie Ramos, like no one knew what he was doing when we were talking, I think it was episode five or six. So if you Google Robbie Ramos, he's a recurring on the new show heels and he was hinting you know, at that uh, way back when, but you know, these are the things and these are the, 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 I see huge things happening. And um, when there's a saying that says that uh, luck is when opportunity meets preparation. I think that's the saying mm -hmm. that's you. Mm -hmm. And that's why, like, I, I always have to say that, like every time I, I talk to you, I feel like I'm so unorganized and I'm not prepared and I'm not, you know, it's just cause you're always like punctual. You're also very like, you know, going to have it like this, this, and this, like very well organized. And I'm not like that. And it makes me, you know, realize I need to be organized. So what have you been up to since I last, God. we last saw each other, um, uh, at an Equinox training over some stupid software. Yeah. Uh, Moso, think, right. Uh, I think it was Moso. <laughs> yeah. Something, something stupid. Um, that, uh, it actually was easier, but it didn't make any sense because they got the iPad system and then they, the transition to... process was abysmal, but yeah, ultimately like yeah. once the kind of like everyone going through a learning curve at the exact same time, mm -hmm. like an adolescence of that particular software yes. was done, it was actually like worth doing. They were yeah. right. The old system was really, it was shit, awful. But... <laughs> it was awful. I think what made it hard though, was that not all the clubs were taking it as serious. So your club, you're at 19th cause at that point, because you started at, mm -hmm. at, at Greenwich. So Greenwich and your club and maybe, no, not Soho, because we had people sub in from Soho. They're awful. They did not do anything <laughs> according to like the training. But um, yeah, that's survival job talk. And they also know if you listen or watch this podcast, uh, there are a lot of people we met at the gym. And a lot of those people are I not at the I've gym anymore. To your one with Viet, and I was like, "Oh, oh Viet!" Like, yeah. <laughs> when he did that, he was just such an amazing human. And I saw yeah. him a lot, actually. We yeah. ended up like in the same. Like, I don't, I didn't do musical theater in in New York at all, but like mm -hmm. the play sphere in mm -hmm. which we kind of like operated ended up with a lot of overlap. And of course, Riley Thomas, mm, um, yeah. who was at Equinox with us, um, he and I are still friends, and it was just like a really cool um, kind of like strange overlap of like this and this and this and like walk into a room yeah. and you can't miss Viet if he's in the room and yeah um and I feel you like I'm probably pretty close to the same way yes. and so we'd like end up fighting each other it was really fun yeah um, yeah it, it, Viet, Viet's a is a character love that guy and oh uh you're right you cannot miss Viet if you're in a room with him you cannot <laughs> with all the love <laughs> so what have you been Absolutely. been up to I know you've been shooting some things um disenchant no not disenchanted. The disenchantment Disen of a young adult yes. and a wild child is my yeah. first short. Yeah. How did, um, how, how did yeah, that come wow, to be? it has been a while. It's been a while. I've been uh producing mostly. That's been like a lot of what I've been kind of up to. I, I very much found that um and this was kind of our specific mission for the disenchantment, but like right after graduating, a lot of the parts that were kind of available, especially in, you know, 2014, uh mm -hmm. pre Me Too and all of uh, like kind of the socioeconomic awareness of like our yeah. castings and lack of diversity and all of this like mm -hmm. it was beginning um to be like oh we need to start including more people but like the roles that really meant like more stereotype roles as opposed to yes. like more like actual good roles and so when I graduated like just the number of like hooker with a heart of golds yeah they kind of like, went up the didn't only they? part available to me I was either like the main character's girlfriend mm -hmm. the like 
spunky um like office assistant yeah or um like a hooker with a heart of gold who needed to get naked about five seconds into said movie and uh, maybe put her clothes off, maybe just di- maybe put her clothes back on, maybe just die. Yeah. Like yeah. it was just the most ridiculous like thing. Um, and I was just like, this sucks. I don't yeah. like this. And so um, my friend had a had a short film that she'd um, written as a result of a like making your own work class um, mm-hmm. at NYU and. So she was like, I want you to be in this with me when I when I shoot it again. Um, Cause she'd done like a, a shooting class and she's like, I want this for my reel, let's do it. And I was like, let's do it right. Mm-hmm. And then we spent the next, let's see, I guess it's been six years working on that project. Yeah. But like, I finally got full like distribution for it during, That's during COVID so cool. because everybody was like, hi, I'm looking for short form content, like yeah. for my streaming platform or for my cable channel for shorts and stuff. And so I had three, three shorts at the beginning of COVID and now all of them have distribution. Really? Pretty great, actually. Like that is amazing. Um, It's thank you. Yeah. Um, and I think I think paid distribution for all of them too, which is also crazy. That's that's Um, amazing. See, that's the thing that I I keep telling people. There's a a friend of mine that I had on here. I think it was like episode six, Bray Brown. And um he took the whole pandemic and the isolation, the lockdown to a point where it's like he's just making something he made he created this thing called cinematic nothingness and um he just was making these shorts by himself at first and then you know it started opening up but i told him i was like you know what this is what the industry is going to be looking for in terms of content moving forward they want to see people who can do stuff by themselves with no budget and good quality and that's what you're doing that's exactly what you're doing it's just another thing is that people do not understand now you have to like really go and get it and that's what you're doing and that's i'm really i'm really proud of you like for that like it's just um really i know it seems like sometimes like it's far away or like sometimes it gets frustrating but you put it in the work you know how hard is that i I mean it's what how many years has this been now because that the first short was a few years ago you started yeah we we finally we started writing it in 2014 and then um we shot it in 2016 uh like may of 2014 december of 2016 we finished it like right at the edge of 2017 and then we started going to festivals with it in 2018 Mm. and so you know two years after that it gets distribution and we spent another six months negotiating a distribution contract and and then um like and now they're here and that's the first one and like halfway through that process i was like i'm never fucking making another short film again this is horrible why do people (laughs) make movies good god i'm gonna let somebody else do this all i want to do is act this is horrible so naturally i have two more two more of course uh, three more in the works <laughs> that's so, perfect and yeah, that's a driving just, um, back. did you have a lawyer representation for that like to negotiate all those contracts for distribution my um the partner that i made it with hannah rose um mm-hmm. a lot of her family are lawyers uh, none of them are entertainment lawyers per se but mm-hmm. they're all kind of understand contract speak mm-hmm. and so we would kind of go through and like read it and look and be like okay what do we think it is and then she'd take it to her family and they would like redline the shit out of it yeah. and then we'd bring it back and be like okay what does this mean for us what are we actually going to ask for and it was crazy. Like the number of people who just sign fucking contracts as independent yeah. filmmakers is absurd. And I'm mad about it because they every, get ripped off. every response was like, this is what everyone signs. Like, just sign it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, like mm-hmm. your contract doesn't have a start date. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> like it says you don't have to screen it, but it also says it starts two months from the first date of screening. Like we could just give you our film and then you never screen it. And then it's under um, exclusivity for the rest of its life. And like, we yeah. never get it back and the contract never ends. And it, cause it never started and we never get screened. Like, no, we're not signing this piece of shit. That's so um, amazing. I, I wouldn't, I, I, you know, that's one of the things that uh, a lot, here's one of the thing, one of the things that they do not teach in any school, grad school, any school. And that's the business, the business period. Mm -hmm. They do not teach that. They don't teach agents. They don't teach uh, negotiating with managers. They don't even like getting a lawyer or what the different terms are in, in, in in the industry. If you're pinned, if you're on hold, if you know um, 
whatever, you know, the, the different terms there are, they don't explain any of that. So that for me, I'm still, you know, acting like, like, like a newbie. Sometimes when I ask my agent, like, what is, uh, you know, the, uh, um, you know, this, uh, uh, the dates, what are they called? The, uh, um, they, there's like special dates that they have, like they, they, they lock it around, um, dates. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't even know what that means. Like usually there's a start date. But then there's like these other dates and I'm, I'm blanking out on the term right now. So, uh, but just all that sort of stuff or like trying to explain like how the residuals work for a commercial or how the cycles work for commercials. Like there needs to be a class so we can understand it so that we're not getting ripped off because we're lucky yeah, because the, the thing monitor that, they like, that through SAG. But before computers, how do you, how do you even do that? You know what I mean? Yeah, because I think the way that they kind of think of it as, and like the, definitely the way they pitch, um, programs mm -hmm. is like you're an artist and we're going to te teach you to art now and yeah. don't worry you'll have an agent who will handle everything that's not art yeah. and like you should be so lucky like yeah in some instances I have an amazing agent and in some instances I'm trying to argue with the director about the fact that I need a call sheet more than 24 hours ahead of time please like yes. you know like you don't get and not all work will be perfect union work that like exactly. all of this shit's already decided and will be done for you and handed off to you yeah. and and it's all changing so quickly that i'm sure so, universities so. feel like they like can't teach it because like oh we'll just be teaching behind the times i'm like okay then get somebody who's like on their shit to like, exactly and working to do so especially if like you're at nyu you know, or, yeah, or the new school, school at like, the time, or like, you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't make any sense to have these big universities in the big cities and not teaching that stuff. Mm -hmm. I remember like dealing with, with agents and even not, not even just business. I was looking for the, the term, uh, but even like the business a uh, aspect of it, where you're talking to agents, you know, the things you can ask them about, or things like, you know, you can ask your agent, Hey, what have you submitted me for? And you're not going to be the difficult actor. You just want to know if they're doing their job. You know, like for me, I had a situation, you know, around when my daughter was born that the beginning of the year was great. You know what I mean? And like, cause my, my daughter was born in, in 2019. So May 25th. Mm -hmm. And wow. at the beginning of the year, yeah, she's, she's so like old already. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. It's, she's starting to, talk a lot and and it's it's crazy she's running around and, and jumping everywhere and at the beginning before she was born that that year january i was submitted for a, a few things and it was like a normal year and then i took that month off to be a dad to help rosa out you know when when, mm -hmm. when she was mm -hmm. born and um for after that like it changed the dynamic changed between my agents and i and i noticed that there was some distance they weren't responding as quickly um as we were talking before I started recording, I said, you know, like, I know the guys I audition against or with, you know, whatever you want to call it. Like, mm -hmm. we're all pals. If one of us is going into an audition, we get a call or we get a, 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 an alert from our, our agent saying, hey, like, hey, there's a, are you taping for this? Or are you going in for this? Like, we let each other know because then we could tell our people. And I started getting tons of text messages every week. It's like, hey, why aren't you here? Like, why aren't you here, dude? Like, hey, why aren't you here? Like, and I started saying like, hey, what happened here? And I would miss deadlines. And stuff that I didn't go in for. And it's the same guys I would audition with, like, just there's no difference. And um, it became an, an issue. And I just realized they weren't really holding up their, their weight. And, you know, it, it worked out to where they didn't want to continue with me, uh, because I was moving back to Texas. And lo and behold, guess what happens when I move back to Texas, we got a pandemic and everything is self tapes. You know what I mean? Yep. So it could have worked out, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But um, that's just, you know, one of those things, but the, we, I broke away from them and who I have now is uh, an agency in, in Austin and they've been on the ball. Like, it's been even through the pandemic. Yeah. We're shut down, but it's just that communication. I think that comes with, with years and like talking to people that have been in the business. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's funny when, and I just like, I think there yeah. is definitely a dynamic of people of like actors get ripped off so much all the time yes by so many so yes. many different people like there's and my mm -hmm. the part that makes me really angry is other actors like charging actors to do like things like 
I don't know, mm-hmm. just and making services that actors mm-hmm. then have to subscribe to or pay into. And mm-hmm. like the fact that we have to pay, what the fuck is it? Like 16 bucks a minute for real material on Actors Access? Yes. Or like 25 bucks a headshot or something? Like, yes. On, on casting networks. And yes. if you aren't subscribed to the unlimited thing for 25, whatever a month, like you can't have more than one headshot on there. But if you yeah. don't have more than one headshot, then like, how are you supposed to like have the like list of looks that commercials want you to have because you yep. need something in a lab coat and buttoned up and all of this. And yep. like, you can't do that unless you're buying into it. And just the amount of that kind of pay to play attitude for actors. It's a racket. Pitched as like, if you're committed, you'll do it. Yes. Like. And like as a screening process, Mm -hmm. but it's not a screening process. It's just them being able to charge helpless actors who can't get in the room to, to do something that like the actor could do, but Mm -hmm. like the screening process is paid because there needs to be one or something. It's just, it makes me so angry. And there's so many different stages of the process where it happens. And I think universities are the beginning of it Yeah, because universities are like, we promise you're going to work. We promise you, yes. that like, you, if yeah. you get a four-year degree from us, that mm-hmm. you are going to be a successful whatever, whatever, and mm-hmm. we're going to do it. And if they started to teach you how hard it is and how much business acumen you would need in your yeah. first like year or two years of school, mm-hmm. you'd be like, oh, this is too hard. I don't want to do this anymore. And you'd drop the fuck out. Yeah. And you'd like, just like, and you'd say, yes. oh, you, you really, you mean there's only 1% of like SAG actors who make their living as actors every yeah. year? everyone else has other jobs yeah oh like the percentage of people who appear on tv versus like getting in their first year of career versus like in their subsequent years of career like mm-hmm. oh like just the if they yeah. actually taught what being an actor was they would not be able to make the money off of undergrad and graduate programs no well you worked with me at equinox and i was on tv while i was at equinox that oh, tells yeah. you no, i still had to work <laughs> I still had to work. I wasn't making like people here, you know, in Texas, like, like family or, or like or, you know, acquaintances, really. They see that I was on TV or I was on the blacklist or I was on this. They automatically think that I have a lot of money and there's hints being thrown out here and there. And I'm like, I don't think you understand how much money I don't make. Like I, I, I post it from time to time. Like my residuals, like from HBO, like divorce, like I'm getting like two cents, like three cents or, or like a couple of bucks, like $4, $5. Like that's not a lot of money. And that's, that's, that's pre-tax too. You know, when oh, I post yeah. that stuff Oh yeah. and um, they don't really tell you that stuff or the fact that is if you work like a, say you work a guest star, you know, and, or the top credit, like guest, and it's like a 10 day, you know, working you know, an episode, you're working those 10 days, you are going to get billed or taxed as if you work that every week for 52 weeks. That's how the government sees it. So if you're going to make whatever the minute, what is it? The scale for a guest, uh, I think it's like eight grand or whatever. Let's just say it's eight grand. Your check is not going to be seven grand because you know, you're going to get taxed. It's going to be about 3,500. Maybe you're going to get taxed so much. You're going to get just a fraction of that and the residuals are great but it's not like you're getting rich unless you've really booked the series reg and that's the thing like people want those series regs or you oh, know yeah it's a crazy biz and they don't tell you that because I, I did not understand the taxes i thought they did it wrong and i i had my manager like at the time break it down for me and i was just you remember keenan keenan joliffe Yes, yeah, 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 of course. I, I actually like, I yes, was asking him, I was asking, I, I remember I got a, a, a check and I was saying, Hey, is this correct? And he's just looking at it, he's like, Ah, yes, look at this. This is how they're going to tax it. And they're going to see you as working this for 52 weeks out of the year with this, even though you've worked this one time. This could be the one job you worked all year. And that's how they're going to see it. And it's just I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm never going to like, you know, make it quote unquote. So yeah, they don't teach that and they should It's just understanding the taxes that you have, or even just being prepared for the, the, the dues or even, um, that first big job. Yeah. You got one, then you got the second and then it's the must join. They don't prepare you for that. And you have to pay to play. (sighs) And and every aspect of the industry is built around 
making actors feel like the only way in is to um kind of pay to join and yeah that's it yeah like and we, even if even here. if like no matter what your track is whether you don't go to school but do mm -hmm. do casting director workshops pay to yeah. play whether you um don't go to school but do make a sundance independent film that like gets you on the track that's you, you know those are expensive you pay yeah. to play um even if you i mean go to school but that's pay to play yeah. <laughs> um you need like, good headshots you, mm -hmm. you have to have good new headshots print mm -hmm. them out and they have to look like you and they have to be shot in a very specific way and all specific. of those photographers shoot for a thousand dollars a shot at least at least uh -huh. it's it's crazy or you said it earlier like with actors access like uploading a minute of footage or even like 30 seconds it's still like 22 bucks mm -hmm. isn't it like 22 bucks or something like that like yeah per per minute round it up so even if if your clip is 201 it'll be yeah. 40 it'll be 66 yeah because they're going to charge you for the whole minute, even if you only have one, the one second on it. That's and so like crazy. just that style of thing just iterates itself over and over and over again in this industry. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I mean, my biggest pet peeve, and I love my agent, but they do this and it pisses me the fuck off, is 20% off union, non-union work because mm -hmm. I'm eligible. I, yeah. I don't have to join and so join I'm in kind of a sweet spot. I'm not going to until I have to kind yeah. of thing um, because I can be submitted for both. And they do submit me for both. They're not just yeah. like, oh, great. This is our non-union client. We'll make non-union money off of her. It's yeah. not that they're doing right by me. But the company policy is that it's 20% off, even if there is a 20% like agent fee on the job. So jobs yeah. will often be like, you know, um, like a thousand dollars plus twenty percent agent fee, mm -hmm. as yeah, like yeah. that's their the that's plus their ten state, or right? the plus yeah, plus twenty mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. and the and even it with this they'll still take twenty percent off of my cut. Yeah, so they're gonna make forty percent off yeah. of my thousand dollars. See, that's the thing that uh, my, my and friend... I'm just like that's that's. That feels fucking bad. Don't it do is. that. It is, and, and Don't I never do that. understood and the no plus ten or plus twenty. There's no way for me to fight that because no. I need this representation. Yeah. See, I, and I, I've been trying to understand that plus ten and plus twenty because they word it in terms of you know this is going to benefit the actor. That's why we're going to give you the plus ten percent. So that's going to be for your agent fees or whatever. But then you look at the stubs, like I had a friend of mine, we we're talking about it and, and he had to go back and forth with his agent because the same sort of thing was happening. And yeah. they'll take know, both sides. Yeah. They'll take the, the agency fee and the uh, other the fee, the 20% from you. Yeah. Um, and tw it's 20% for non-union work at my agency. And so I'm just like, yeah, nah, so crazy. nah. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And then, um, they also will charge the dues twice a year. So when I got my SAG card, I was a must join in the July. So I got it in July, I paid the 3,300 at the time, which was a huge expense because we didn't have that money to put on a credit card. And I thought I was good for the year. No one explained it to me at the SAG office when I had to go in person that uh, they do, uh, they take dues twice a year. So in the fall and in the spring, so November 1st and uh, I think April 1st, they take due. So I had to pay another $200 or something in, in, in November. Okay. So keep that in mind. Pandemic shows up, right? So they were giving out a credit. So if you paid ahead for like SAG insurance, they'll give you a credit and that, that did help. But SAG dues, remember the industry was shut down between what? May, March. Oh, yeah, no, they still and took like, oh, I know this. All they were saying is like, no, no, no. What we could do is we can just postpone your dues. We're not going to waive your dues, even though no one worked this year. <laughs> we're not going to waive them. We're just going to postpone them, but you still got to pay them in full. And while they did that, SAG Insurance raised their minimum to keep the insurance by 10 grand, which is ridiculous ridiculous so now it's even harder to keep your insurance and the the premiums went up you know by a couple hundred dollars and so people and i, and I think that might have affected some pensions for like older members but it's just it's so crazy how like they could do that during a very hard time and so that's another issue which 
brings us after all that griping we're still here and we're doing it <laughs> love it yeah if they taught this in schools if which they to be you fair, would be at least to prepared fair, to fight you know or, or every single teacher that i had every single teacher that i had undergrad which is not the institution the mm-hmm. individual teacher was like yeah don't do this yeah. If you can do anything else, do something else. And you yeah. know what? Now, when anybody asks me advice, guess what I say? Don't if you this. can do anything else, do something else. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep. You have to just be so ready for every single form of rejection. You have yeah. to be ready for somebody to, like, A, I mean, easy, not cast you. Um, yes. Or t- you have to be ready to, but you also have to be ready to never get an audition. Mm hmm that you like are right for. Um, You have to be ready to book it and then lose it. You have to be ready to book it, shoot it, have it end up on the cutting room floor. You have to be ready to book it, shoot it. The cutting room floor just never ends and the movie never comes out. Yeah. You have to be ready to Mm -hmm. um, not book it and get a personal email telling you you're wonderful, but like not this time. But don't worry, we'll do. We'll reach out to you again. Get a personal email saying, "Yeah, no, that was bad," and like <laughs> hating everything about you as a human being. Yeah. Like just every single possible iteration of like rejection. Here is my heart and soul for a camera. Is yeah. that enough? No. Okay. All right. Yeah. Then. Yeah. No. The business side of it is not fun at all. I just told the story that I got my must join that July of 2015. So I, it was for Mr. Robot and guess what happened to that one scene? You're never going to see it because it was on the cutting room floor. And so I still had to pay and my scene wasn't even in the show. You don't get residuals because you're on nothing. Exactly. Um, Yeah. So that's one of the things it's the business side is very heartbreaking. And my, my, uh, one of my Mm -hmm. teachers, Peter J. Fernandez said, you know, if you can see yourself doing something else, do it. You know, if this is the one thing you really and truly see yourself doing, keep doing it because it will be fruitful. Because if you can see yourself doing nothing but this and you work and, you know, work for it, you will find some happiness from it. It may not be monetized the way you want it to be. It, you know, <laughs> like it, it's, it's, and it's just like, you. I mean, how many, okay, you, you went to NYU. And, you know, you, you see this all the time from NYU students in particular, they, they have a very good high success rate, you know, mm-hmm. and you, you see people maybe in your cohort or, you know, in other years. And it's like, how did that person book that they had zero credits or, you know, like how did they sign with CAA or WME, you know, with zero credits? How does that even work? Like, there's like, you, you see that, you know, and you're just scrolling. It's like, how did this person sign with this? And you see like, Nothing, nothing, you know, student film, nothing, nothing, CAA. And it's just how does that even, or UTA or ICM, like the big five, how do they get there? And then it's just, you know, it, 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 you, it's very easy to slip into, you know, a hater zone. And I've been personally working on just distancing myself from that. You know, it's just so easy because it's, it's a little bit of a competition mentality, but it's kind of like, you know, where are these opportunities for everybody? Or, you know, like I even see it for like other people. Like, why don't this, why didn't this person get seen for that? I just mm-hmm. don't get that sometimes. Like, it, you know, it, it's, it's frustrating, um, but uh, you're doing what you got to do. And that's like creating your own content. Like truly, that's exactly what you're going to do. And I think that's how you're really going to break in. You, I, I, one thing I admire about you is your, your networking skills and, and hustling. Like I, <laughs> I'm awful at that. Like awful, awful, awful. I I genuinely do credit making work to making me better at it. Um, yeah. Because then I feel like I'm not, the, the thing about actors is we end up coming to the room like, hi, give me a part. Yeah. In like yeah. every single iteration of networking, um, which is one of the reasons that a lot of filmmakers kind of roll their eyes at actors because we're a lot mm. as human beings. And Definitely. also we like, even when we're on set, we like want to be kind of the center of things, but we also don't have anything except like ourselves to give. And mm-hmm. like, there's a lot that that entails and our craft is is great. And good filmmakers have a lot of respect for the craft itself and actors who yeah. have that. Um, but like the, um, 
but I think that like coming into the room as somebody who was making something, mm -hmm. which was both, which both meant that I would possibly be making something in the future and needed to know you, even if you were a sound person and like yeah. couldn't hire me. Like I am still interested in you and the work you have done because I like might need a sound person six months from now yeah. or might know somebody who needs a sound person six months from now and like would love to recommend you kind of thing and and that feeling of like being able to be mutually interested in interested in people who are not just like writers and directors who like could yeah. possibly cast you but yeah. like the whole kind of thing and then also feeling like I have something I have the power to like hire and give back to people yeah. that I really like, as opposed to actors who are just kind of like, well, I hope it works out. Like if I get famous, yeah. I'd be happy to sign on to your indie project. It's like <laughs> the only thing we have to offer. Yeah. And that's really hard. But do you find though that since you've been making your own work, you've been creating, you've been, mm -hmm. I don't want to say distracting yourself from the act, like the, the business, you know, like you going out for audition, like you're still doing that. But mm -hmm. because you're doing your own work, the quote unquote business side where you're being submitted there's not as much stress on you and there's a, you feel like there's a little lot more freedom going mm -hmm. into the room oh yeah definitely because the um and kind of one of the ways i think about it is like especially during this pandemic i um had kind of a a, a crisis when i as i'm sure many people did mm -hmm. um when i i realized that like it didn't matter what time I woke up in the morning mm -hmm. because I'm somebody who's always like gotten up really early and gone on runs. I mean, I've, I've run a couple of marathons and yeah. I really like morning runs mm -hmm. and, and all of this, but now I live in Los Angeles where it's always 75 degrees and it doesn't matter what time I get up. I can always go on the run. Yeah. And, um, and like the realization that it didn't matter what time of day I woke up because nobody was waiting for my email. Yeah. Um, yeah. was really, really hard. Yeah. Like that feeling of like, just not feeling like I had anything that, I needed to contribute like I could just skip a week and no one would notice yeah um and that was really really difficult um and yeah, that, yeah. what producing my own work does is it gives me something to get up for even and like and yeah maybe halfway through the day I get an email from my agent that I have to do a voiceover audition or a commercial mm -hmm. audition or something and re record a self-tape and that takes yeah. up the whole rest of the day yeah. um but like maybe maybe I don't and it doesn't matter because I have this other project that I'm working on and yeah. the not needing something to come in in order for me to feel like I was, my time was worthwhile, yeah. um, was really important to me, especially when I had nowhere else to be and, you know, not even a day job to kind of demand my attention. Yeah. Um, I, how, how often was it like a long period of time or long stretches of time where you were feeling like, I, I I don't want to like say like you were depressed or were if you were depressed because of that. Cause oh, yeah. I mean, I, I was getting the, the reason why I created this whole podcast was because I felt like I was never going to work again. And there are days, even in the last few weeks where I'm like, Oh my God, am I going to work again? I don't even know what's going on. And you know, um, that, uh, that feeling like, was it long stretches or would it come and go in phases or you just remind yourself, you know, like I'm, I'm, working on something else or just I got to get to working the it was it was like week-long stretches I mean mm -hmm. I've, I've had like daily blips of that every once in a while in like yeah. a, my previous life pre-pandemic the, the before times mm -hmm. um that like where you know like especially if you've like I would do theater and like be rehearsing something every day for mm -hmm. six weeks and then and then performing for a month and and feeling great and like having somewhere yeah. to go every day and something to work on and then like the play ends mm -hmm. and you're like yeah yeah um around <laughs> yeah and yeah. like not having anything else necessarily to work on and feeling very kind of like stifled by that like that would be like smaller blips because the world was still moving and ooh, and yeah. things were like still being done and mm -hmm. I was still needing to like be out in the world and and be my presence was required yeah. but when the world really stopped and kind of came to a grinding halt and so did auditions and so did um kind of the opportunity of producing something next and yeah and all of this it kind of like wound down really hard I I would ended up in like a two-month spiral which ended in me chopping all my hair off 
uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. <laughs> which helped a lot because then I had something else to work on because I needed to completely redo my website and yeah. all of my materials to reflect like a very different um, character type than I'd previously done. So I was like, yeah. okay, now I have a new project that like yeah. is this. And that really like kicked me back into action, which was really nice. But yeah. Um, but the crisis was just one of those like I, it doesn't matter what i do <laughs> like, yeah, no it, it's it's a it was it's a crazy it last year was a very crazy time in in terms mm -hmm. of i think everybody was affected in a different way but in the same way because it was so mm -hmm. uncertain we didn't know what was going on or you know it was like you could have been making just a ton of just gaining a bunch of ground and like finally getting that momentum you needed and then boom nothing 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 mm -hmm. nothing and it feels like all that hard work was for like nothing you know and that's for me that's how i was feeling personally like where i was um just i felt like i just ran as fast as i could and 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 i and it, it gets to a point where i realized that where i'm running to is like that edge of a cliff and it's just like there's no more footing, you know. It's kind of like those those movies where they're what was it the uh, uh, rebel? It's like Wiley it? Coyote. Yes, Wiley Coyote. Yeah. And like, there's like you know, yeah, and pa! boom, that's how I felt. <laughs> and um, you know, I I I look to people who were creating and still finding happiness. And I just I wrote like a, a review um about a movie called Host, and it's on Shutter, and this was shot over Zoom. This whole movie was shot over Zoom. Mm -hmm. They, they that. quarantined, they isolated. Yeah. They it was very well acted. I mean, it's a found footage film, so the the acting tends to be, you know, for for found footage films, it, it tends to be where people oversell, you know, the natural, you know, like oh, is this? A, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. We're not being filmed, but I'm gonna act like I'm not being filmed, and you can tell they're acting like they're not being filmed. Um, but it's very natural, and they did this over quarantine, and got distribution and everything, and and it just made me think like you know what, there's so many people doing this right now. Like what, what am I going to do? And then I, you know, I see that you're working on stuff constantly and you just posted the other day that you read tons and tons of scripts and 10,000 pages, 10,000 pages, over 2000 of those were scripts. <laughs> yeah. That was a lot. So you managed to keep yourself busy. And I think that's something that mm -hmm. a lot of actors, uh, young and old need to like learn from because you know, it's nothing is ever handed to us. You know, like, where do you get this work ethic? You're like, were you always like this? Or like, were you pushed as a child? Or, you know, yourself? I was, I, I've been neurotic since I was a kid. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, Very type my, A, would you say? Oh, yeah. Which oh, is yeah. not a bad I, thing. My wife is the same my, way. Um, I like have had like a color coded planner for like 10 years. I oh, just amazing. like, I'm such a, I, I do my, my like day plans by the minute. I have like, I've just always been very much, very much like this. Um, like to the point where when I was in like high school at one point, I like got a shitty grade on something and, um, like in my calculus class, which I hated and was so bad at. And yeah, like, I, was, I usually yeah. show my mother my report cards like halfway through and you get them and all of this. And I remember walking in and I'm holding my report card and I was like, hey mom, this is bad, but it's going to be better later. So I don't want to show it to you. <laughs> and she was like, okay, I trust you. That's awesome. <laughs> like, Thanks. And like turned around and left. Um, just like fully like, nope, I do not accept this. I will not do it. And so she didn't need to be like, okay, what's the subject? How are we going to make you like succeed at it? How can we help? She was just like, you're going to handle that. Uh, Cause you're going to be more mad about it than I am. If it ends up that way. It's like Rory Gilmore. <laughs> exactly. Just very, very like, no, it's sorry. It's not, it's not good enough. Never mind. Um, yeah. Which has both its upsides and downsides. It I does. mean, the upside is that it like means that I'm, you know, constantly busy and I have the, the thing that I love that I actually just restarted doing is um, I try to do five to 10 things for my career every day. Um, yeah. And I post them in my Instagram stories and I, I used to just write them down um, and do them. And this is mm -hmm. a, a piece of advice that I got from Jamie Hector, who mm -hmm. came to speak it. He was on um, The Wire, wasn't he? The Wire for a long time. And he came yeah. to speak at Strasbourg when I was there. And he was like, do five to 10 things for your career every day. Yeah. Just like, doesn't matter what it is, like recite a monologue and an accent to your shower head. I don't care. But like five to 10 things to like make you feel like an actor, um, which is kind of in that line of like, 
just have a reason to wake up and keep working even if no one's calling you kind of thing. Um, And I I really loved that piece of advice and I I used to just write them down, but then I started posting them and I was like, this is great. Like I feel such accountability and also like a positive feedback from people and people responding to me with like the thing that they like relate to in the work that I just made or the thing that I'm talking about and um, and like kind of broadening my my conversations with people and talking to different people because I, you know, like you and I uh, talked very briefly this afternoon about um, Olivia O'Brien because I yeah. um, am part of a streaming podcasty yeah. music review thing yeah. um, that's called uh, Mandy and the Tones. And it's really? these, um, it's these three, um, rock star LA rock star girls who yeah. um like watch music videos by LA artists usually mm-hmm. predominantly women but not exclusively um and up and coming and watch music videos and kind of talk about and over them and just like chat about it yeah. um that's, and that's awesome. been really fun and we stream every Thursday and it's great so I was doing my prep for that and so we're gonna we're like, gonna like, also we're gonna promote that at the end of this podcast again so people can catch that <laughs> Uh, yeah, Olivia O'Brien, I'm hooked on that song. Uh, I feel empty inside, <laughs> so empty inside. Her music videos are amazing. I love that 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 video for that, the, the location for that. I wonder I who have, lives I there. Watch that one. You haven't? That house is cool. AF. Yeah. It's one of those houses in the hills. You know, they're probably the, the like Hadid's dad. It was it Gigi Hadid's dad probably built? It's getting protested by all the neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's just like her singing her song and there's people passed out like drunk or whatever in the pool, just frozen there. And it's just like, I love it. I love it. it it's, it's so great. But you have done these activities for your, 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 you know, things that an actor does, you know, five things every day. I remember you telling me that at Equinox, like in 2014, 2015. <laughs> yes. Cause I just I heard this piece of advice. I remember you saying that we're at the front desk and you say, I'm going to start treating my, my acting career as a business, like a business. And I'm going to do certain things. And you were scheduling. I remember because, you know, after nine o'clock, cause we closed, you closed. If you worked mm-hmm. with me, you closed. And um, it would be that you were going to like schedule, like I'm going to work on this and this from like this time to this time and this time to this time. And I'm not going to lie to you. I tried. I didn't tell you. I tried to do the same <laughs> thing. I'm just like, ugh, it's embarrassing. I'm lazy when it comes to that stuff. And I really admire that. And I think I would probably be so much further in my career if I had done these things. Uh, but I'm working on it. And I actually, it's like really like in, in the last few months, it's really hit me where I've found a schedule and I'm mm-hmm. starting to do more of that. And I'm working on like finally writing more. Um, but I, I, I truly remember like you always, I always think about that. It's like, you know what, she's always doing this. And every time I, I, I look at something you're doing, like today, you also posted something about like, you know, these are the plans, the goals I had for 2020, maybe didn't happen, but I'm going to run today. And then, you know, there's these certain things I'm going to be doing for the, the career and I'm going to post them. And I'm like, you know what, that's the motivation people need. Otherwise you're going to be jaded waiting for what the call. Like, oh, you're yeah. going to be famous, kid. You know, we've got you this audition. Right. And that's like, and that's, I think a lot of actors kind of do that. It's, mm-hmm. And there, there is a world in which like you get an agent and that does happen. Like that has, that happens to people. And the problem is the like one-off people that it happens to are always the stories you, ref- you like berate yourself with when you're like, why hasn't it happened to me? And and I'll, I'm not gonna lie, like I have huge imposter syndrome being on this because I like I haven't booked a television role. Like I I've made several short films and I've been in a couple of features and but everything's super indie. I like and so I just feel like and yeah, yeah I work really hard, but you always kind of like feel behind the like standard for like where you think you should be and like that the negative side of being anal retentive as fuck because you're like cool so at this time i should have done this but instead i got tired and i fell asleep to be this productive and now it's this productive and i know it <laughs> like it's awful um and that's but that's it's easy to let that get you down and some days it does but it's just about getting back up and being like okay that didn't go how i needed it to go i can still do whatever i needed to do to make myself feel better and do the thing Oh, I can't hear you. So, yeah. Hmm. Hey. I can now. There you go. You can hear me? Yes. I had lost sound yeah. for a second.
Uh oh. No, I can. All right. I don't know what happened um, there, but uh, you can hear me. We're fine, right? Zoom technicality. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Yeah, this has been happening, uh, but yeah, it's, it's true. You got you to gotta keep working. You got to keep doing all that stuff. Yeah. Um, what, what do and it, you- like, it, it can feel like I'm doing a lot of stuff and there's no reward for it. And then I'm really tired. And at the end of the week, I'm like, what did I even do this week? I really, um, I understand which was that. always the dual purpose of recording is. Yeah, but I, but I understand that feeling of you're going to do something, you're going to put in all this work and it doesn't feel like you're going to get anything out of it. It's kind of like you, you have a plant and you water that seed and you watch it grow and it doesn't feel like it's growing fast enough, but before you know it, it's a tree, you know, and it's a big, strong tree. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing is, and one of the things like, I even, I, I, I started taking classes again because once again, like, believe it or not, like I remember things that you in particular told me and what you were doing. It's like uh, one of the, the statements was we were at that Equinox meeting and you were doing a one-on-one -on -one at that time with, with some, uh, one of the, the manager or uh, either casting or whatever. I did so many of those. I and could now not me, tell you who it was. You told me, uh, it's like, you know, you've been fortunate. You don't have to do that you've never had to do that. And I thought to myself, I was like, I've been very lucky, but I can't take that for granted because at any given mm -hmm. time, that rug can be pulled from under my feet and guess what happened? The last two years, zero. It's been nothing. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to like, you know what? I have to be prepared. I've been taking classes, I've been writing, and it reminds me of that cartoon. And I've said this in several episodes about that grasshopper, you know, that cartoon of the oh, the world owes us a living. And he's playing the, the fiddle. Do, 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 do. No, I ants, don't know this one. So it's an old, old cartoon. And so this grasshopper is just, you know, dicking around and wanting to have a good time while the ants are preparing for the snow they're gathering food and they're just working 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 he's like oh you're working too hard you need to have fun basically is what he's telling them and they say no you need to prepare and guess what happens that snow comes and he's outside cold and starving and the ants are inside and they're prepared they're warm they're feasting they're having a great time and they see him out there freezing almost dying and they pull him in and they you know they, they put his feet in hot water you know to warm him up and you know, they give him food. He learns his lesson. And I feel, and I felt like that grasshopper. You know what I mean? Where I just, I did not take advantage of a lot of things that I should have been taking advantage of. I should have been doing a lot more. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm going to have that series regular, you know, because I've been doing this though. It just means that when that opportunity comes, I'll be a little bit more prepared. Whereas you are going to be very prepared for very, 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 many things like a lot of things are you like you've you already yeah, have production hat. you have your production hat your producer mm -hmm. hat you have your writer hat you have your director hat like you I don't write well you should I don't write okay. I I that is I am actually pretty adamant about that um I think there are a million people whose stories really 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 need to be told and made right now and mm -hmm. I'm a rich white girl from Texas I, I'm not one of them <laughs> like well, we're in Texas? I am Dallas I'm from Dallas that's right. I'm on from the other end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I yeah. Forget. Yeah. Um, and like, and I like, I okay. have a lot of like all the opportunities that I've had. I am extremely grateful for, and yeah. um, and that's a big part of that. But I feel like what I want to do is be a part of the teams that help tell the stories, yeah. um, as opposed to being like, hey, like, give me the money to make my story happen. Like, I mm -hmm. I think that there are people who. Um, know what their story is, how to tell it and how to make it like make the world a better place because it exists. And, um, and I am just want to be a part of making sure that the world is a better place at the end of those people getting to tell their stories because creatives are not often very producerially minded. And so <laughs> um, the skills that I have to like help people tell their stories um, is, and even as an actor, like I see myself as a cog in a wheel. It's I'm yeah. not like, I want to be a part of the story that needs to be told, but yeah. a huge part of that is me not being me. It's me yeah. like 
coming in and being serving a role in the story that like the director or the writer um, envisioned that um, and complicating it and making it more dynamic when where possible, especially if it's written two dimensionally and being like, hi, women are real people. And like, yeah, yeah. you know, like adding that to it as well. Um, but just kind of like making sure that um, I, I see myself as in service to the stories that need to be told. And right now mine isn't one that needs to. So I'm I just applied to grad school actually, we'll see um, for a producing nice. degree, but like to really kind of lock down the skill set that like is needed to help people tell new and diverse stories. And so that's kind of where I'm where I'm headed, hopefully is like really? refining that skill set yeah. to be um, a contributive member to a team that, yeah. I mean, I'd really like to act in whatever I make. Yeah. I've acted in everything I've made so far, yeah. but um, but I think ultimately the thing that's more important is making the world a better place because it sucks right now. <laughs> that's really awesome. I really admire that. That's just, you know, we're in a very selfish business. They're truly a selfish business. And there's not very many people who would openly admit like, you know what, I'm going to put my personal, you know, endeavors aside, but my personal endeavors are really to make your personal endeavors better, you know, or, or like to get those things seen, you know what I mean? If I can help in any way, like, you know, that's so awesome. You don't really hear that often or ever, ever, you know, and you're going to act. I, I, I know you are. Um, you, you work really hard at that and you, uh, you, you still trying to do like, you were doing a monologue a week at one point, weren't you? I was trying to do that for a long time. I did that for, for ages. I have not done that in a minute, especially since now I'm most of the stuff that I've been um, booking and working on has been voiceover and mm -hmm. I'm kind of like trying to break into video game and animation and yeah. the kind of um, the character creation um, aspect of things um, in, in the mic space. Um, yeah. Hello. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, um, kind of like leaning into that. Um, but um, like her, I'm playing Horizon Zero Dawn right now and I just like every time Ale speaks, I'm like, I could do that. This is me. Yeah. This is, I could, yes, yeah. this is exactly what I want. I yeah. want to be a badass bitch, like killing robot dinosaurs. Like, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, have you happened to go in for video games? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I went in. Okay. I, I, I told you voiceovers for me. Uh, I had an awful experience for a video game. And it was, I think, for like a Grand Theft Auto sort of deal um game and it was one of those cliche stereotypical kind of casting uh experiences that you hear with like uh with mexicans or like with people of, of you know different diversity um or ethnic backgrounds and uh i was going in obviously if it's like a grand theft auto type of gang a uh, game it's like you know you gotta play a, a cholo or a mexican gang member and this casting director was like, you know what? You need to do it like this. Like, hey, Holmes, what are you doing, Holmes? Hey, Bato, I'm going crazy. Like, he was, like, making a mockery of it. And uh, I, I kind of just, like, uh, you know, I, I mean, I just, you couldn't believe what, what, was, what was happening. And um, that happens all the time. And I know he's, he didn't mean anything by it, but I'm just kind of thinking to myself, like, man, I don't want to do this. You know, if they're just not like they're just making fun of of you know a culture, even if they are like cholos or whatever, it's just like I can't get down with that. Um, well, I have a lot of problems with Grand Theft Auto in like, yeah, a lot just, of spaces. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, I mean, I say if I went in for it, I'd be. Can you do your best inter impersonation of a hooker being run mm -hmm. over, please? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, or ah! be like fuck yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's just like that's the one video game I think I went in for. Um, I know Red Dead Redemption, uh, a lot of people, mm -hmm. I, I knew I had a lot of friends that were in that and that was really cool, cool. to see. Um, and I didn't realize that that game had like all these storylines, like video games are really evolving into like, Amazing. you have Amazing. characters the fighting on video now. Games is insane. Yeah, there's actually like, is, there's, a, there's a story and you know, almost like it's a different movie, you know, w with the video games and these characters and they look so real and you can create these characters. Oh, it blows my mind. Are you, you need big... to do motion capture shit? Yeah. If they're like doing that and they put the, like the dots in your face. Yes. Um, I was uh, in a movie with um, Alex Milton Reagan, who um, is an incredible, wonderful actress. She was playing Mary Shelley. Um, she was phenomenal. Um, but I was uh, Percy Shelley's first wife in this in this production. Yeah. And um, she has done a lot of 
um, video game um, work. And mm -hmm. she like posts about it all the time. And it's really cool to see her in the mocap suit with the dots yeah. on her face. And I'm just like, this is so neat. I definitely want to do that. Yeah. Um, it's really, really cool. And uh, I am dating a computer software engineer who works in like um, all of that, that kind of uh, VR kind of experiential uh, design space and stuff like that. And so um, that like, I've been introduced to that world and my roommate does a bit of that too. It's like really, really cool. That's so, so if you would have to say like, if there's something you would love to do, like this is like a dream job, would it be that? Or is there a, another like, uh, like a Game of Thrones type of thing? Like, a, like, a, like I mean, a... Sansa was the role that I missed or <laughs> sorry, the role that missed me. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> there you go. There you go. I was Hodor missed me. Turner's age, but definitely <laughs> still in school. Uh, yeah. Definitely. That was, that was the one. Um, mm -hmm. But uh but yeah, um, would you like do like a fantasy? I don't, yeah, I mean, I would love to. I mean, I have a lot of theater answers for this because I love plays. That's fine. Yeah. In terms of like pieces of writing that have made the world a better place, like yeah. plays are incredible. I mean, I yeah. like Hamlet is my dream role. Yeah. Um, and doing a, a production of that would be fucking amazing. Um, Hedda Gabler, same thing. Um, mm -hmm. I love Hedda. But, um, but I think the the kind of like where I'm at right now, especially living in LA, um, the the kind of horizon zero dawn, like uh, female journey, yeah. um, storytelling, like uh, God of War has a really good um, yeah. storyline, fewer women in it, but, um, mm -hmm. but like still really cool. That kind of um, family relationships taking the key to being the key to storylines mm -hmm. of, of video games. I really love, I think the kind of, um, um, there's a great YouTuber who goes through feminist, like anti-feminist yeah. tropes in video games. And one of the things yeah. she talks about is like the woman in the refrigerator yeah. who's like the, like, you killed my girlfriend. Like, and oh, therefore yeah. I will come for you. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. thing that like, and therefore the whole thing is just like revenge porn of because yeah. she not only doesn't have autonomy, she's been killed. Killed, yeah. And like, is just the prop for the main characters like journey to go on so that yeah. they can like stand the prop the the like plot for the video game on the stilts of like her death and like yeah. his re emotional response to her yeah. death and she like only has lines and flashbacks in which she tells him that she loves him and like yeah. they meet for the first time and like yay <laughs> and or she's like screaming and like all this <laughs> <laughs> so. you know like because she's been raped and tortured or whatever yeah it's like that there's that movie i saw the devil uh i think it's is it korean i'm not sure but the guy the the hero is i i guess in their police department i don't know if he was like their their equivalent of the fbi or whatever and uh, his wife is driving you know and then you know she gets stuck obviously and there happens to be the serial killer who like butches her and uh the the hero tracks the serial killer down and he beats the shit out of him almost kills him like so he, he'll get him to almost like an inch of his life and let him go just so he can go catch up to him and do the same thing over and over and over again and that does I, that's kind of like an you know extreme version of that but it's like his wife had to die um but uh was it two or three weeks ago did you see in the new york times there was this article about this woman in mexico who tracked down the cartel members that killed her daughter. I think it was like killed her daughter. And this story came out, let's just say it was on a Sunday. It was on the New York Times on Sunday, like three weeks ago. I would like to say three weeks ago. And uh, she tracked every one of these guys down either. I don't, I'm not hundred percent. I don't remember if, if she killed them or got them arrested, but they were all dealt with. Like there was like 13 guys that she, she this mother went after. By the end of this week, so this came out on Sunday, by Friday, the rights had already been sold. Yeah. There was already a <laughs> bidding war for this. I, and then when, I, when Rosa sent me that link about that, on that Sunday, I said, just wait. Let's see how long it takes for them to make a movie about this. And I was partly joking. And Blumhouse- Five minutes. Yeah, like literally five minutes. There was apparently like 13 studios going after this story. That's amazing. Isn't that crazy? See, I love that. I think that's like, that's there's awesome. like so much more work like that that needs to mm -hmm. be made where like the the protagonist and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be 
women, I think, like, the fucking Asian American man in, like, the lead role of a video game as well would be yeah. amazing. That isn't a you know, Kung Fu like, fighter. Um, it's just like, stuff like that. Hold on just yeah. a second. I yeah. realized that my computer is about to die. I need to go find my... Yeah, thing. go for it. Oh. I'm going to fill in real quick. For those of you just catching up, uh, Shannon Spangler is uh, getting a charger for her laptop because it's going to be... Uh, I guess it's dying right now. The battery is dying. Shannon and I met at uh, our survival job at Equinox on Greenwich Avenue, which was a great experience. You've probably heard me talk about that experience at the gym. I don't know for, uh, I mean, several episodes. I've had several ex coworkers from that gym on the podcast and we've all moved on and done big things. And that gym, you know, aside from it being an awesome gym to work out at, it uh, provided uh, great friendships such as this one. And, um, you know, it's, it's great to see the people, you know, how far we've come along since those days and what we've been, you know, what I, I'm very proud of everybody who's just, you know, worked their way out of there and they're working on their own projects and she's back and she's charging her computer right now. And, um, yeah, charged. you did it. We are plugged in. We're plugged in, yeah. we're charged up and, and ready to go. Um, so what, uh, so you have three more shorts so you you worked on the one you shot the one got distribution you got distribution mm -hmm. for two more and you say you're working mm -hmm. on three more yeah right? i um, busy, i'm busy. working with um actually the well what's really cool is when you kind of like start making stuff you find the people with whom you mm -hmm. want to continue making stuff and um i had an amazing roommate in new york um when i was there um her name is nora uncle and she's also a prolific writer and director and producer and so she and her company have been a part of almost every project i've made and so now whenever she like has something i'm like hi i'll help you produce it or yeah. like hi can i be in it um i joke that i'm like the mascot of their production company because like in their like the they're real i'm like oh and there's me and there's me <laughs> and it's just like yeah. very fun um but like finding partnerships and and teammates like that yeah make it possible to just be like and let's make another one or let's do this um i have a um a great friend who um whose feature kind of caught fire and we've been like what are we going to make together like let's find a mm -hmm. way to do it and people who like have made work want to make more work and so just kind of like being a part of that has been really great i also run um a collective for filmmakers um that i want to shout called film shop um yeah which is, um, it's mostly based in New York, but I was uh, really excited to be um, one of the founding members of the LA branch of this group. Awesome. And it's just a like weekly workshop where everybody brings in a project and workshops it in front of and with the, and receives feedback from everybody else who's there. And so it's, it's like 15 people in, in a chapter or something like that. We had, I think we had up to 20 this past time because we're virtual, so it's easier. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but just being a part of that and kind of like consistently seeing people's work and giving feedback on people's work and like being a part of that. A lot of that are how I read 2000 pages of scripts yeah. this year. Yeah. Um, and, and so just kind of like getting, having people who are making work in your life is makes you want to be like, no, I can, I can totally make a short. Like, absolutely. So like cool. I've got two grand. I can make this happen. Yeah. Like, do you see yourself going from shorts to a feature soon? Or, oh God, I want to make a feature so bad. Do you want to do a feature like, or, or are you thinking about TV too? What would um, be, the, what, really what's, what's the ultimate them. goal? Your, your favorite, like what, per, what would you prefer to do? Should I say? Um, I, I would like, I, yes, is really the answer to that question. Um, <laughs> um, but um, I would really, I really want to um, be a part of a cable network show running team. That'd be cool. Um, I don't, again, I don't write, so it's not necessarily inherently my concept, but um, yeah. bringing to life something that um, could be on a stars or an HBO or um, yeah, uh, Netflix is kind of going the way of like network television at yeah. this point. They're um, selling out. Way. They're trying yeah. to compete with Disney. Yeah, uh, so you can't. You can't. You can't. You cannot Disney People Disney. thought they had Disney that. down, and then Disney comes out with that big release they had like last week or the week before with all the Marvel and all the series mm -hmm. and all the Star Wars, you know, spinoffs. And it's just like you can't compete. There's, there's so many like, Star Wars spinoffs. It like hurts my soul. 
how much time, effort, and genius goes into making things that have already been made yeah. less good than they already are. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. the the whole Marvel universe, like I there are some gems in it and i do yeah. love that they've really used the most recent iterations to give and disney is doing this as well uh, over across the board is giving um directors and, and actors who have not had show running opportunities or directing opportunities like um dallas bryce howard directing multiple episodes of yep. uh the mandalorian, mandalorian and being yeah. in them stuff yeah. like that um was really really cool um and i think they're doing a good job of that but ultimately, like, can we just see some different IP ever? Can we like be yeah. creative with the no. IP that gets invested in? Please? <laughs> like, do we have to do we have to make Ant-Man 2? It, they're making it Ant-Man exists. 3. Why? Yeah, it was announced. Sorry, I think they're making so Ant-Man 3. Uh, I can't even uh, I don't remember the name of it, but it's a they're making an Ant-Man 3. But they're gearing up for the next phase of all the Marvel films. So I think the new Thor is gonna lead into that. Like I like the Marvel films. I'm not a huge comic book nerd. Like my favorite character of comic books is Wolverine and he's kind of like a standalone dude. Um, but I really was impressed by what Marvel was able to accomplish over so many years and tie all these movies. to. It's, I, I don't know if that can be replicated ever. The way yeah. they tied everything in. I, I, don't, I don't think they, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say that it can't be done, but I don't see that. It's just, I, I felt like it was a fluke. Like, how everything from, you know, Iron Man to, you know, Infinity War and what, what came before Iron Man? Uh, Avengers. Avengers. The Joss Whedon Avengers, yeah. which was like the first one. Yeah, so it's just like, you know, what um, really can, you know, can they replicate something that almost perfect in, in terms of like DC can't do it. You know what I mean? And they're, they're, they're struggling. Did like you I saw watch the new- Wonder Woman 1984? Man, here's the thing it. about Wonder Woman. <laughs> And I knew it was getting all these bad reviews, but I'm the kind of guy that says, I need to see it for myself because people are haters. Like there's this fan base usually that just is such sticklers as like to, to either the, the original content, like from Especially the comic Especially with or women directed films or films yes. about women, people have it's, a tendency to be even more nitpicky. Like Birds of yes. Prey is a great example of like yeah. people just hating on it because it's feminist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, um, mm. Yeah, and, and it's, it, it's one of those things. So I saw the movie and what I saw was a film that should have been the first film, not the second film. Like it was like, if you watch Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, it had the same kind of CG. That movie came out like in 2000, what, 2001, I think, Harry Potter. And that was the first film. That was like the, the, the first film in a franchise that was going to be the test film to see if we're going to continue making more films in this franchise. And then you get a bigger budget and then you get better directors. Like, and then you get the prisoner of Azkaban, which is like almost a perfect film. And then, you know, with, so good. Yes. And, and, and you, you have, you know, Wonder Woman two, and I'm just looking at the CGI and the fight scenes and the story. I'm like, what happened? Like you, they had the ball and they just gave it to someone else and they ran the other way. I really don't understand what happened there. Like especially, what, especially the storyline. Like anybody, like there's no excuse for a Marvel movie to be bad because you can take every risk you want and be every kind of like Silly. amazing, yeah. like art, art auteur or whatever. And like, you can give the, like, you know, Taika Waititi, like every yes. fucking opportunity that you can possibly yeah. give and like, just go for it, have a good time. We'll be able to sell it, don't worry because yeah. you will. Yes. And like, that should mean that they're amazing. And three quarters of the time, they just feel like a series of studio notes that didn't end the movie. Yeah. And like a, a studio notes with the, some capital like character names and that's it. Yes. Like yeah. it just, it falls so short. And like, I mean, Wonder Woman, ev like, and I, like, <laughs> the first time I, the first Wonder Woman movie, I also thought was pretty terminally average, but I don't like superhero movies. I'm not yeah. in for the genre as a yeah. whole. And I walked out being like, well, I'm not sexist. I also didn't like the the superhero movie about women. Like it's yeah, not yeah. that there's like yeah. all men are directed by men. That is my problem. I just don't like the genre. Sure, fine. Um, yeah. People have great things to say about Captain Marvel. I'm sure there are solid things on the Disney side, but mm -hmm. um, 
but I was like, oh, oh, I just don't like this genre. Good. Like, yeah. I wasn't being like weirdly anti, like anti male director in any way, shape, or form. I was like, oh no, I just don't like it. Cool. No, but like, the, the first, the first one of them. If you looked at the fight choreography, that was top notch. It was good. That was really it was cool. really good fight choreography. And then you have this second movie, and it's kind of like the we're not going to do fight choreo for this one. You know, and we're yeah, gonna we're fly just gonna have her swing around on a rope that yeah. can do whatever we feel like it does, and don't have to worry about the rules of and yeah, hooray! Uh, it just like it really fell flat. I mean, the acting that like, you could tell they were working with whatever notes they were given in the script, and um, you know, and and you, you see Pedro That's Pascal. True. I think they all did a good job. I think Gal Gadot has the hardest job in the world. I think yes. it is it is impossible to write Wonder Woman because yeah. she is inherently like perfect. Yeah. And so if you have any kind of flaw in her, yeah. it like undermines her Wonder Woman-ness, yeah. which I also think is like problematic in a feminist way because you like can't have a flawed, victorious, heroic character in the mm -hmm. same, like that's a woman in the same way that you can have a flawed character that's a man. Like, I mean, you know, Tony Stark is all kinds of flawed. Um, all kinds of flawed. He gets and to he do loses whatever he wants the, the whole time. Yeah. and but he still can be a superhero at the end yeah. of the movie. Whereas mm -hmm. if a woman is like unlikable for any moment, we lose the whole audience. Mm -hmm. I'm like, bleh. That's what happened no. with Star Wars, didn't it? Uh, yeah, the, but the, with the, the, the Rises... trans character. Yeah. I don't oh, even God. understand what happened with that or why people were upset with her. I really don't understand. Like I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out. And uh, trying, like I try to have people like tell me what happened and I'm kind of like, okay, <laughs> and? You know, and I'm not like, you know, and? I'm not like like some woke dude or anything like that, but I'm just kind of like, hey man, so why are we really mad about this woman? You know what I mean? Like like her. Like, she I, wasn't five foot 12 and, sorry, that's just six foot. Because yeah. she wasn't five foot 11 and thin and like dared to be in front of a screen and take up a lead character role. Oh, like, yeah. how dare? I was like, you know, Adam Driver looks like a catfish. No one ever says that. <laughs> Right? He looks like a catfish. And I mean, I mean that with like the most respect. I love catfish. I mean, Adam Driver is an amazing actor. Yeah, he's an amazing right. actor, but he looks like a catfish yet, you know, they tend to love him in this, this biz. Yep. He's got a voice though. He does got a nice yep. voice. I can listen to him narrate books if he did that. He's got a good one. I wonder, I listen to, I do the headspace meditations to fall asleep oh, yeah. at night. And um, I know, I think Calm has one with a lot of like celebrity feel, Hawk? like no. Ron from Game of Thrones did a bunch of those. Oh, yes. And, and Stephen Fry has a few and there's so, like, and I'm just like, I wonder if Adam Driver has any of those. Cause I, you're right. I would yeah. probably sleep. He's got a I good voice. Like I really do. Like, I'd rather listen to him than see him personally. That's very <laughs> mean. You know, I'm not the most <laughs> uh, attractive guy either, but like, I don't look like a catfish. I look like a gorilla. And, um, <laughs> But speaking of Steve, Stephen Fry, uh, did you ever listen to the Harry Potter audiobooks? Uh, yes, I did. And I listened so, to the Stephen Fry version because okay. they are so much better than the Jim Dale version. Thank you. Oh, Thank my God. You. I was, that's what I was getting at. So when I got them, I didn't realize there was two different versions. I didn't realize there was a Jim Dale version. I had the first like four, I had the first six, so there's seven books. I had the six books with Fry. And then the seventh book, I had to listen to Jim Dale. And that threw me off so bad because Fry was just like, it's smooth, smooth, like him reading it. And he and acts have, the shit yeah. out of them. He's such yes. an actor. Like everything about them is like, he performs each mm -hmm. of these characters in their role. Like, Perfect. I mean, his Lockhart sounds like Kenneth Branagh's in the yes. room. Like yeah. I literally was like a Robbie Coltrane and Kenneth Branagh just like being summoned for like yeah. an arbitrary, like they just like, hey, just come reprise for a little while because his imperson impersonation of them is so good. Yeah. And also like the performance is so full mm -hmm. and Jim Dale can't even say Hermione. He's or, like, Harry, <laughs> Harry. What are you doing, Harry? Uh, yeah, right. Her whole performance is it's like same nasal. I'm like, I didn't hey, know how we're going to do it, Harry. Hey. Like, shut up. Uh, yeah, it sounds like a weasel. I don't like it, not one bit. I was not a fan of the Jim Dale version. I don't know. We do. We got off topic about that, but when you said Steve Rock, <laughs> I, I was just thinking about that. Strong opinion. So I'm with you. You know, you're the only I'm, person I've ever met who like has listened to both and knows the difference because most people because you can't buy the Stephen Fry versions in America anymore. You can't. Scholastica and the 
Um, Scholastica has a like, um, I don't know, like a range of influence where like you cannot, like you can't buy yeah. them on Amazon except as like a full box set that gets mailed to you. Yeah. You can't um, get them on Audible. You can't get them on, you can't even, I tried to download a VPN yeah. of Audible so that I could get Audible UK yeah. and then download the Harry Potter books from and there. And like I also wasn't that. allowed to do that. And they really? blocked that because my VPN failed. And wow. they were like, you're not in this territory. You can't have these. And I was like, that fine, sucks. then I will illegally download them. I guess I tried to pay you. <laughs> I did that. That's how I found out. And I said, you know what, for this last book, I'm going to do the right thing. And I was like, you know what? I'd rather be wrong. Because like Steve Vai was so, <laughs> so much better. True. I was already invested for the first six books. And then it got to this guy and it just threw me off. I mean, I still enjoyed it, but it's just like, yeah. no, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Dale. Um, so but that's that JK Rowling is super problematic. And at this point, everyone should be legally downloading her stuff so that she doesn't make more money off of a property that doesn't support trans rights. Love, Shannon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, She's on the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean you know she's a billionaire so she's she's good she's good I, she doesn't need our help i mean no she has a new book out i think i think she has a new book out um uh, i mean i read the casual vacancy which is the one that she not, wrote a while yeah, ago yeah her first adult novel since then yeah i think there's a hardcover i just saw um kind of like in the fantasy realm as well i'm not sure what it is um but you know i think the harry potter books are just so good just so so good and it's just like i mean if you look back at like look roman polanski is very problematic very problematic but rosemary's baby is one of my favorite movies and i'm like you know are you gonna it's very tough and it's like one of those things too it's like after knowing everything polanski did people are still willing to work with him which blows my mind you know what i mean yeah. it's like let him let his art live you know wherever it is but like, don't say you're an advocate for like, you know, anti like child abuse or yeah. anything like that. And then work with him or give him standing ovations when he wins Oscars or anything like that. Like that whole thing, it just like blows my mind about that. Yeah. Or you know? yeah, I, I even think like, don't, I mean, <laughs> again, illegally download it. Like don't yeah. support their like, because when you give people platforms, they will do with it what they want to do with it. And you get to decide who's, who, whose platform you were endorsing with your dollar every time you buy something. Yeah. And, and yeah, so that, it's just a matter of like, if, if you can find it where they don't make any residuals off it, where they don't get a stream count from it, where they don't mm -hmm. um, like benefit from it in any way, shape or form, you can sure it's like, watch manhattan watch rosemary's baby um, oh yeah manhattan yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah um, i forgot about like movie. and and all of these but people um, still want to work know. with him he just made a new movie and people are right. still he makes a movie every year he makes and, a movie and, and he's still like, like that's the thing that gets me it's like okay if you are going to be very vocal like you you're vocal about jk Rowling, right and mm -hmm. yes she wrote some brilliant books but moving forward you don't see yourself working with her right mm -mm. no so nope. if if Which you, you murders if you, me because I would love to work on the Harry Potter properties. Like, yeah. oh my God. My yeah. my Hermione Granger personation is absolutely perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean literally I, I worked with this one um, voice act voice director at one point because I had this really cool audition and I um I was like, hi, will you coach me on this? And um and he I was like, well, my it was asking for like both an American accent and a British accent. Mm -hmm. Like, and he was like, submit both, go for it. Um, it can you do a British accent? It's like, absolutely. Except my British accent is based on Hermione Granger because that's how I learned it. <laughs> like, and he was like, oh, oh yeah, no, you totally, you could. Like, if I need a Hermione Granger impersonation, I will be calling you. Here because go. Here's my card. It's like, you're dead on for that. It's like, um, <laughs> and you are, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'm Helena Granger. So my question for you would be, if you were to receive a breakdown after we, we, we hang up, right? Your agents call you and they say, hey, JK saw you in something and she really likes you as the older version of Hermione for, for I don't know, something. The new Harry Potter. The new well, yeah, Harry the, Potter. The Harry, the, what's the, the Deathly Hallows part two? 
No, um, The Cursed Child. No, not They'll House, make a movie. Uh, Cursed the Child. Cursed Child. Yeah. They'll make a movie of that. What would you say? Would you say no? Could you could you separate the art from the artist? Is what I'm asking. In this case, I know it's a tough thing, and I don't want to put question. you on. Uh, but, but that's just the thing. Like, yeah, you know, like, no, and I think it's really valid because I like it's easy for me to hypothetically say no, but if I was actually granted that opportunity and the like the amount of good I could do having the platform that this problematic thing would give me is probably greater than the amount of good that it does for me to reject that because they're just going to cast somebody else. So should we have somebody who's like anti-turf in like in a role that like could kind of counteract J.K. Rowling's yeah. very problematic views? Um, I, I, I don't know because I don't know what where it would be if I already had any kind of platform and it's being offered it because she's seen it then like yeah. that would give me a power to say no it's all yeah. very semantic but at the same you, time I can't blanket no and that's because you truly weird. are very passionate about like what she said and you know how she's she's you know voiced her opinions about you know trans trans lives and for me like on a, on a different way different path in, in, but in the same question it's kind of like I hate the whole cartel kind of genre about drug dealers and Mexicans are, are being, you know, portrayed as this. But I've been asked, like, you know, I, I say I don't want to do a show like Narcos. I don't. I really don't. But, but if at you the end of the day, serious rag on Narcos, and if it's a really good character that gives me something mm -hmm. to work with, like I think, man, it would be a very. I, I I don't think I could say no personally. I really truly really couldn't. It just depends. It depends also on the characters, but at this point, I don't think I could say no. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or um, I don't know. I, 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 it'd be very hard. So I get what you're saying, but we're we're also not at a point where we can really fully say no to a lot. Exactly, you know, like exactly. Like I can't pay my rent right now. I'm like, yeah, really needing this stimulus check that's going to come through. Like, who am I to say? Like, though, I, I mean, I've been like requested for auditions for the republic for republican campaigns um in the yeah. mo this most recent election for vo stuff and yeah. um not through my agent stuff that i submitted for outside and um then it was just like political campaign and then i get the copy and it's like has stood with president trump no matter what and like all of this yeah. and i'm like not reading this yeah <laughs> like not, you can yeah. keep your thousand bucks go did away. you but like, did you know that it was for the for that particularly not when i submitted for it but as soon as i got the copy i rejected the audition because what was like the what did, what would it say the breakdown what did it, it say was just like for a political campaign in uh, iowa I said, okay yeah. that makes sense i mean and it, it like I was didn't or say, illinois i don't remember which but it like it was for a senate race yeah um in in uh one of the midwestern states and i yeah um Illinois, Indiana, or Iowa. I don't remember which. It's yeah. stronger than I. Um, but I I got it and I was like, Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm not saying these words. Yeah, I couldn't I do that. I wouldn't do an ad for a cigarette company. Not that cigarette companies are allowed to advertise, but yeah, know, no, but um, I get it. I get that because of what it's what it entails and, and what it you go. I'm actually on an ad right now for plaque psoriasis with Cindy Lopper. So, you know, if it comes hey. to dry skin, you know what I mean? I'm I'm your guy. <laughs> I'm your guy. I got John Tucker, but like, if I, I don't think I could do any political campaign right now until everybody gets their shit together in that, in those buildings, man, on both sides of the hall, uh, on aisle. I, I just can't, I can't understand how we uh, have had the year that we've had with no uniformity. And it starts from the top, starts from the Trump, but down to the Speaker of the House, it comes from Pelosi to McConnell. And it's just like, okay, there's no uniformity. Our country is just like so divided when it comes to COVID where there's anti-maskers, there's maskers, there's COVID. Right? There's people that were on their deathbed denying COVID till their last breath. They didn't believe that they had COVID. Like it was just a, a, a hoax. And the fact that like no one on either side of the aisle stood up for anything. I and mean, it was all about money this whole time. You know what I mean? It just blows my mind. And it just makes me want term limits for all these people. 
They're there. Everybody. Speaking of, I don't know. Oh yeah. It's term limits. Everybody. A hundred million percent. Absolutely. Um, speaking of, uh, if you're in Georgia, uh, and have not oh, yet yeah. voted in the Senate election at this point in time, please vote. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's election just... day is tomorrow as a recording date. Oh yeah. So when this is actually playing, it would have already happened unless something crazy yeah. happens tomorrow. So we'll see what happens. I mean, I, it's, I mean, okay, it's been a year. Who knows? Yeah, 2020, it doesn't feel like 2020 is over. I feel like it's just carrying over to 2021. Like when, you know, like every year prior to 2020, it, you know, the whole new year, new me, when it strikes midnight, there's this kind of feeling like new year. It really does feel like mentally or like, you know, you're playing a psychological game. Like it is a new year. So there's new goals. I can do this. But I felt like 2020, I don't know about you. It feels like it's just like, eh, 2021, what's going to be different at this point yeah. for me? Yeah. I, I, I don't feel like 2021 is really going to start until like April, you know what I mean? Or July. Like, <laughs> well, yeah, it then. won't start until the vaccine. Yeah. That's like until stuff is actually opened up and like is opening up. And like at that point, it'll feel like something has changed at all. Yeah. But until then, like it's, it, it doesn't matter. Um, and I think like, and I think the, the key is, um, and something that I have noticed in a lot of people is that 2020 felt a lot like about a lot of coping. Like mm -hmm. it was just like everything kind of fell apart and everybody was like, how can I keep myself together? And like mm -hmm. not really able to do so. Yeah. Um, or finding ways to do so that were unhealthy and then like needing to go back yeah. and like figure those out habits out and like all of this kind of thing. I drank a lot in 2020. Yeah. Um, and think, so like figuring yeah. out how to cope and, and now in, I think the big shift that's been happening this year like in it's just been four days so who fucking knows how long it'll last but is people yeah. being like okay i'm no longer coping i am acclimating i'm no longer yeah. coping i'm going to like this is how things are and i will make yeah. this work for me do you also and I think people feel... are doing that a lot more now than they were before yes and with that being said do you feel now that there's people that either they just either gave up or they said you know what enough you know like it, it could be either like they totally gave up and or you know had, had a reawakening sort of so to speak you know what i mean i think I th i've been seeing and of course this is what i see this is a lot of social media lens and what everybody's going to put onto social media is going to be a lot of like and we commit <laughs> you know yeah. like yeah. vibes um yeah. it's going to be the like and like maybe it won't be our year but we're going we can determine our own futures <laughs> like that's you, like the end yes of and I think that there's more of that happening. So, but I think personally, I'm, a lot of people are like, well, that sucked. Yeah. And um, there's nothing that's going to promise that this is going to suck less. So I'm just going to deal with all the parts of it that suck and accept they suck. And yeah. like, then do what I can to make the world a better place within these confines. And that's what you're But doing. I do think, I mean, the best thing that has happened this year, and I like, I <laughs> I hope I speak for all fucking white people. Yeah. It's like all of the like, oh my God, how bad is racism? Like yeah. tone of surprise yeah. um, aspect and just the amount of like work that needs to be done um, like by literally everybody to dismantle white supremacy in this yeah. culture. I'm not even yeah. just gonna give the United States like precedent on that. I think everybody has that, yeah. um, that same problem. Um, and so I think I it's the- yeah, I, I do believe that there there are some some a lot of issues that need to be corrected about that and just cultures in general uh, all together. I live in an area where it's almost the opposite though, where the whites are the minorities, and we didn't have much culture. It's like ninety percent Mexican and ten percent everything else, and like maybe five percent white. So it's like ninety percent Mexican, five percent white, and then you know that five, other five percent was you know everything else, you know. Um, that's changed. And so a lot of what's happening around America wasn't really happening here, so to speak. So it's hard for people down here to understand what is happening in Minnesota or in Chicago or in even in like Dallas. We're like 10 hours away from Dallas. And like, it's a different culture. Like we're in, in a, a big ass state. It's, it's a big ass state. And people don't understand that. And I think to lump all white people is as like white supremacist is, is kind of broad. It, it, I, I mean, as a Mexican guy, like I, I, I gotta say, like not all white people are bad. There's gonna be bad people of all think, different but, races. But we all, 
Yeah, but we all participate in like a, a white dominant culture. So especially the like um, the prioritization of even just like colorism within mm -hmm. communities of color, like the way that like um, that can and I should not be speaking on this. I don't know enough about it. Um, mm -hmm. But like there's there are ways in which the the dominant culture being white culture, like, mm -hmm. for example, the Queen's Gambit and chess. I have not seen that yet. I want to see that. Super good. Um, yeah. I, I have not watched the whole thing, but my boyfriend watched the whole thing and we've been playing chess ever since, like religiously, yeah. like a lot of chess. Yeah. And, um, and it's really great. And we were talking, like we were just sitting around playing chess and like um, drinking wine or whatever. And uh, my boyfriend just made this like offhanded comment about like um, how nice it is to feel cultured. Yeah. And And I was like, and I just had this flash of like, we, that is what cultured means, mm -hmm. but all of the activities that we were doing, like board games, like, inside, white people things. like are yeah. like, are drinking red wine are all white yeah. people things. And yeah. we're sitting here being like, oh, we are participating in high culture and yeah. like intellectual culture. But yeah. that's because we have this inherent like disposition that like, that is the right kind of culture. Yeah. And we don't identify it as white culture. No, we just it's just identify being, it as like high the culture. over the, the blanketing statement of culture. I get that exactly. I, I, if, even if you're at like um, I don't know any kind of like um, like uh, any like any kind of ethic anything that's like mm -hmm. like a, an event of any kind, you are also cultured. You're just not white dominant cultured. Yeah, and no. we just don't think of them the same way. And we participate yeah. in this like highbrow lowbrow bullshit. Yeah that like puts white culture yeah. over everything else. And that's shit. <laughs> I, I do believe that there is like, there is that. And there's also, you know, depending on where you're at, a dominant cultural, you know, uh, backing or just, there's gonna be a dominance of, of that particular culture. Like here, you know, if you were white growing up here in South Texas, you were bullied. You were the minority. You were the beach at widow. You're like the one getting beat up every day. And I remember I worked at an after school program when I was in high school and there was one white kid in, it was like Eminem, you know what I mean? But with Mexicans instead of black people and he got beat up. I had to break up fights all the time and he had to be, he ran, he ran him out. And that happened throughout, you know, his, his like throughout, you know, my life. I've seen that happen in elementary junior high was really bad because he grew up on the south side of town and um you know that was where majority of the you know the the, the bad kids were but um you know it's it's i think overall as, as a human race if you watch anything or, or or notice anything like we have lost this kind of empathy toward each other in general overall like just like if you you know you saw the police brutality but if you turn on world star hip-hop you have a fight comp every week and every month where they glorify for 20 minutes, people just beating the shit out of people. And that's glorified, it's the fight comp and that gets millions and millions of views. And guess what? A majority of those people are all minorities. They're, they're just either they're black, they're Latino. And you know, we, we see this in, in other countries too, in the Middle East, just beating on people, you know, hunting people down for being gay or, or whatever, like humanity itself is just a very vicious, vicious, you know, species i guess humans are i'll just, argue that it has mean. always been we always just have yeah. an internet in which to view it now to see it now and that's the thing i think and we like, can and the see metrics it. exist and there that's are, like, i i think that's a good thing that now this type of behavior is being outed like this brutal behavior is being outed whether it's a, a police you know abusing his, his power or you know a child abuser abusing a child or you know just people beating women or, or even women beating children. Like, it's just like, it's a, it's a circle that needs to be exposed. And, you know, I think if anything, we need kindness. You hear my kid crying in the back. She feels I it do. too. She's <laughs> feeling that how humanity is just so awful <laughs> for each other. <laughs> but I mean, it's just like, if one thing this year has taught me about that and like racism it, it exists i'm not going to deny that at all i lived in jacksonville florida and in 2007 2006 2007 i lived in jacksonville florida and um there was a clear black and white line you know there is and there were police shootings 
like there was in the first two weeks there was three murders and oh there's like six murders and three of those were police you know shooting black people um that's plain and simple and and that's that's an issue on both sides of the aisle there's like racism on both sides and it's just like this needs to stop we're like one country one you know there, there's never going to be a unified america ever unless people start realizing, hey, we're on the same team. Let's help each other out. As long as these kind of like, you have Baltimore's, you have Chicago's, you have Louisiana's, or just like the whole state of Louisiana, parts of Texas that are so underfunded and just ignored, you know, because New York is number one. LA is number one. Let's focus on San Francisco. Well, San Francisco is kind of going downhill, but like Austin, you know, like you live in Texas, Dallas, there's parts of Dallas that are just taken care of better than neighboring cities around there and you know once they start pointing out like hey there's communities that are being underserved i think we're going to have a better america all together and i think police reform is like a, a good start you know to kind of address all these these issues like there's a lot of distrust of police but we still need police and it's just a very it's it's a hard it's a, a fine line i think you know because I don't know. I don't even know where I'm going with this. It's just so much craziness going on in this country right now. And it's so divided for so many different reasons. Like there's so many people hating other people. It, it, you could be, you know, um, back the blue or Black Lives Matter or Republicans or Democrats or, you know, Antifa, the government. And like, there's so many like different like things going on right now that there's just in the time that we needed to be united the most, we were the most divided. And that comes from leadership. Our president didn't do anything. Our VP didn't do anything. Our Speaker of the House didn't do anything. Mr. McConnell didn't do anything. Like they only in, like fed that. that yeah, that well, hate, that's because that that's what, like, I mean, it benefited them to do so. They're not Ridiculous. interested in their constituency. They're interested in them. And even yeah. like the, the, even the best of the Democrats, their mentality is like the exact same thing I just said about the JK Rowling thing is like, I can do better with a larger platform, even if I have to compromise to get it. Like, yes, that's they like themselves. the Democrats will also compromise because they're like, I just want to help the max number of people. And yeah. if I have to like sign this $94 billion, $194 billion, like military budget over the next 15 years or whatever yeah. the fuck in order to do it, like in order yeah. to get the other shit that's on that bill passed, like I'm gonna sign it. Yeah. And I'm like, no, we don't need $194 billion spent on the military. Like what? And, and just how much, like how much, okay, of, and, and any of that, uh, going back to any of this COVID relief or anything, how much money was being spent on our school systems? When, every, when, when our school system nationally was so underfunded and then you get hit with a pandemic and teachers had to teach from home while also making sure their own children were learning from home, they had no financial backing for that. And that's what, what no. it, it's, it's, it's really upsetting. Like for me, I did it again with the, the sound. <laughs> I did it again with the sound. Um, but for me, like if we don't spend the money we need to spend on our education, then we're not going to get any better at all, at all. And no campaign, like throughout this whole election, this past election, I don't remember hearing a single president, you know, candidate, presidential candidate or VP talk about school at all. I mean, Biden did a bit because his wife is, his wife is yeah. in education. Yeah, but and not much. You know what I yeah, mean? Like, and so not, that nothing, was like, nothing. so like Biden wins education, end of story. It was like kind of yeah, how the campaign Because his it. wife is a teacher. So, you know, I know more than Betsy DeVos, which anybody with a brain does. You know what I mean? And, and that's like one of my biggest peeves is that we don't focus on our education at all. You know what I mean? And I don't know. What do you think about the vaccine? I'm going to segue to that. I just, I get so heated when it comes to like, like our whole country and like, it just stems like from education or lack thereof or lack of care from our politicians for education or anything happening for education. Like I live in Hidalgo County. And if you Google Hidalgo County, we're the most, we're the poorest county or amongst the top three poorest counties in the nation and undereducated. And it's so sad because all these kids are being just left behind. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And it's not. Yeah, the and only I think there have been administrations everywhere. that have tried their best to do so, but what you end up with is kind of like, like um, when I was in 
uh, when I was in middle school, my, I was in Plano and yeah. the place, the town next door was Allen and yeah. my, and Plano is a really, really wealthy suburb. Um, yeah. it was like on like, <laughs> I remember I went to college and like saw this article that was like, Plano was like number one on like safest yes. cities in America yeah. because it was like super homogenous. Yeah. Um, socioeconomically, not actually, um, racially, I had a much more diverse group of friends in, um, yeah. yeah growing up in Plano than I did yeah. in uh, New York at all. Yeah. Um, but um, the, because NYU is really racially white. Yeah. Um, but the, um, like the, our school district had like in the No Child Left Behind administration had mm -hmm. things taken from it and money was given to Allen, which is right next door to us. Now, yeah a lot of Allen was also really wealthy and though they just weren't as big so they didn't have quite the revenue that Plano did yeah. and so they were a much smaller school system so they used that money to build a like two million dollar football, um, football stadium yeah Texas as opposed to of kids course. who need fucking paper in yeah. your town also yeah. in Texas yeah and yeah. It was and, just and like, teachers are buying the school supplies for their children that can't afford the school supplies they're yeah. getting paid peanuts peanuts to teach kids who parents already don't want to deal with their kids most of the time so when it comes to disciplining or any kind of like just like reinforcement about like hey your kid's not doing any work they're not present it's it's a very heartbreaking thing for me I mean I was substitute teaching and I was going to go into teaching in a public school setting and I just couldn't I couldn't do it my heart was breaking every single day I was there uh, at, at, at these schools, these different schools. And I, it was same, it was different schools, same situation. And I just couldn't see any kind of answer for that at this point, because there's no backing. They have no backing. They, they're doing, they're working with what they're given and they're not given anything. And I imagine that's what it's like in, here in, in Hidalgo County or in New York or in Dallas. Yeah, or it's in LA. Just, LA I mean, it's, I, LA's I, just I, as bad. I volunteered bad. with this group last year called... Um, um it's like readers los angeles or something we're reading partners los angeles reading partners los angeles and they um basically each volunteer has a kid yeah. that they meet with once a week and you just read with that kid yeah. all you do is like go through reading curriculum because that kid has fallen behind on the curriculum for their year oh wow yeah and like the reason for that is is totally like doesn't matter at all they yeah. just like have fallen behind on the yeah, curriculum right. for where they should be yeah. um in their grade and mm -hmm. so they just need more attention to make sure that they keep up and can yeah. read as well I like that. and um it was really really cool and i just like would go in every thursday and like meet my kid and he was adorable and precocious and yeah. very quiet for the first like five lessons and then like slowly started opening up it was totally rewarding yeah. i hate kids but i was really rewarded by it. <laughs> <laughs> but what was really cool is just over the course of the year i saw how much better reading he got and it wasn't yeah. my fault like he had no, another no. tutor and also he was you know in school five days a week yeah. but like just the amount of like learning that goes on when a kid can like actually be in a classroom and learning and like yeah. the amount of growth that can happen and he was so curious about like space and robots and like all of this cool stuff and we had like all these great conversations about yeah. like would you want to go to the moon and what would it be like yeah. on the moon and like it was just really cool and I was like I just want to foster all of this in you so That's badly amazing. Um, yeah. but like being my individual attention for an hour a week yeah um and the is so valuable because it's just about like the validation that somebody like that a kid gets that's not like one-to-one -one, like this person said this and therefore I think this now it's so much more like the the feeling that a kid gets that they can do it that they are yeah. making progress that things are getting better that like and the way that their adult in the, the adults in their lives respond to that are so important yeah um no I agree in that particular 100%. process as well yeah Wow. Like uh, when we, when we add 22 kids in a class and one uh, teacher is responsible for wrangling them, like the kid never yeah. gets that much attention. Nope. But if you can get 10 kids in a class, you can give that much attention. Yep. That makes so much more sense. Eight to 10 kids, with one teacher. Mm -hmm. It's already a lot. Oh, wow. You know what? This has been a great conversation. Like really good. <laughs> it's been catching up. We talked about video games. We talked about, you know, 
being prepared for when that time comes and, and keeping that work ethic to like our crazy politicians and now school. And, you know, it's been great catching up. And one thing that's always, you know, impressive about you is your work ethic. And if you continue doing what you're doing, I see just a bright future ahead for you. Uh, you have, you're doing everything right. You know, just keep doing what you're doing. Keep producing, keep, you know, you're building the right connections. You realize like, this is the things that the stuff that, you know, from one moment to the next, you you have distribution. I remember when it was just a concept. I remember when you're trying to do like, a, weren't you crowdfunding or like even just yeah, trying to get it off the ground and now it's got distribution and like you see these seeds are being planted. And I know that you were getting frustrated at some point a few years ago when I spoke to you that you weren't getting the opportunities that you were wanting, but guess what? You're making those opportunities for yourself and that's gonna be more rewarding because you're not relying on somebody to create those opportunities. You're not waiting by the phone, you know, like, you know, oh, I'm just a love stricken puppy, you know what I mean? And, you know, they're not calling me, but you're there writing. It's like, if they call, they call, I'm gonna do this with or without them. And that's the mentality mm -hmm. that I, I love to see and uh, the kind of people I would love to work with in the future. And, you know, if you ever have anything cool for me, I'd be down to work with you. And um, you know what, That's, this, is, this has been great. I really appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for having me on. Um, and Absolutely. like right back at you for all of your stuff. I mean, like obviously this podcast, but like <laughs> all the work you've done and like, I mean, you're, you've done it you've like made it to this like place where um you are working and like it comes and it goes and it lives on a fucking like roller coaster yeah, of it is. like every other week it feels totally yeah. different and um but i think you like you're on the ride and yeah, we're, that's, we're that's on really, the ride. Really cool. remember we were on the ride we started the ride together sometimes the ride uh, di diverge but we're going in the right direction we started out mm -hmm. working a horrible but I'd say rewarding front desk job experience Absolutely. because horrible in the sense that we saw humanity at its like lowest sometimes over the dumbest stuff ever. Oh my God. But if we didn't have those experiences, I don't think we would have had as much drive to get out of there. You know what I mean? Like, I think it, yeah. it really, it, 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 also, it, at like, least for me, it, it, it motivated me. Like, you know what? I see these people. I want to be where they're at is success wise, but I don't want to be them. I want to be better, mm -hmm. you know, in terms yeah. of a human being. And, you know, that's, I think one of the most rewarding things for, for both of us or any of us like Viet and Carrie and like everyone else that's, you know, worked with us, uh, that's on, that's been on here. And, um, it really is kind of a motivating factor. You don't want to be there forever. Truly. Yeah. And I, but I also think like the nice thing about a gym job as opposed to, cause I worked in restaurants for Truth. five years too. Truth. And that's way worse yes. because restaurants have this kind of MO of like, you make more money, yeah. um, which I think is a part of it. Um, like you make comfortable, comfortable money if you're working yeah. it regularly, uh, especially in New York. And, um, and so you just get into this place of like, I hate it, but it works. And I yeah. guess I'm just going to stay here. And this is, how, and like, it can get really, really toxic internally. Um, yes. But and, I think for the, women, the gym mentality it, of yeah. always like being like, we were surrounded by personal trainers. And after I left Greenwich, yeah. I went to 19th street where the personal yeah. trainers had a lot more relationship with the front desk than the yeah. Greenwich. Yeah. Um, but like the mentality is just like, I'm here because I'm working on something. I'm here yeah. because I want to be somewhere. I'm here yeah. because I'm like striving to be my best self. And everyone yeah. around you is striving to be their best self. And like, Absolutely. that's why we all show up. And yeah. like, we're all fucking coaching each other on how to be our best selves. Exactly. What the best self looks like for any given person. Amazing. And I think like yeah. that makes, that's why the gym is such a cool hub for people yeah. who are doing really cool shit in the future is because yeah. it is this like, what next, what next, what next mentality of a place as opposed to like the what next being a, you know, fried soul yeah. uh, <laughs> as opposed to uh, yeah. tilapia last week, you know, like it's just like, <laughs> yeah. it's, I understood soul as S O U L. I know. So I had to qualify the fish. I was yeah. like, <laughs> Yeah, it's like instead of Talavia, I got that. I, I love that. Um, Speaking well, of charming Pixar movie, if you haven't seen it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's so good. Well, for me, I kind of got distracted 
by New York City, and it made me miss New York so freaking much. I know, I had the same. So freaking much. Like, oh. like, have you, I have actually picked up those little helicopter seven. seeds. Yeah, yes. The little seeds that he, the little leaf yes. thing that he like has in his hand. I'm like, I have totally fucking grabbed one of those and put it in a pocket yes. because the day was beautiful. And I like walked down the street and saw, one. like, I have done that. It's yeah. so perfect New York. Like it yeah. really, really is. 14th and 7th, I was always there. Equinox was around oh. the corner. Always. Oh, man. Well, can we find you on social media anywhere? Yes, absolutely. I am at Spangler Bird. Spangler Bird. So my Bird. last name Spangler and Bird. Bird. All right. And uh, is there anything we can uh, look out for in the next few weeks, months, or... or- well, the disenchantment of a young adult, young adult and a wild child uh, will yeah. be coming out on Shorts TV in awesome. uh, probably about a couple of months. Okay. Um, and then, so keep an eye out on that. It's a cable channel. Um, yeah. so if you have cable, it'll be in your subscription and send me a, send me uh, like whenever it comes closer to that, send me some, some info. I'll post that. Yeah. On there. As soon as we have dates, yeah. I'll, I'll update you. Amazing. Um, and then, um, my short film stray is a post-apocalyptic sh- short film about a girl who finds the last man alive after a virus wipes out half the planet. <laughs> that was timely. And we made that in 2018. Amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah. But Which... uh, that is on dust. Okay. Um, Sweet. Send me some info on that and I'll, I'll post that up there. Uh, well, it's been great. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And thank you everybody for, for watching and listening. As always, you can find me on Instagram at Jorge's Isolation Podcast or on YouTube at uh, Jorge Chapa. Um, Shannon, thank you so much. And it's been, it's been so great catching up. All right. Thank Have you. a good one, everybody. Bye.